Welcome to Life Recovery Today with Stephen Arterburn. In the next half hour, you'll obtain insights and tools to transform your life using the biblical principles found in the 12-step program. We believe everyone can benefit from a life recovery experience because we all have struggles in life. Struggles with addictions, food, depression, anxiety, and relationships to name a few. You'll be encouraged to see how others have found a new way of life with hope for the future through life recovery. Your host is Steve Arterburn, founder of New Life Ministries and Women of Faith, author of over 100 books, and teaching pastor at Northview Church in Carmel, Indiana, one of the 20 largest churches in America. Steve is the co-editor of the Life Recovery Bible, the number one selling recovery Bible. With over 3 million copies sold, this is the Bible given to inmates by Prison Fellowship and the Pew Bible for the Salvation Army. Now here's Steve. Hi there, Steve Arterburn here, and welcome to Life Recovery Today. You know, we're continuing looking at the 12 laws of life recovery. And this law today that we're going to deal with, law number four, is the law of willingness. And um, I, like many of you who are in recovery, know that this is a very, very difficult thing to acquire or to want, to be totally willing, to, to want to do whatever it absolutely takes to get better. Man, that, you know, we can say, well, I'm willing to look better or I'm willing to get people off my back. But I'll tell you, when we hit bottom and we finally say, hey, I'm willing to do whatever it takes because everything I've done now, well, it just hasn't gotten me anywhere. And a lot of times the law that we follow doesn't really make sense. And I can't remember whether it's the hummingbird or the bumblebee, but one of those two, nothing makes sense. They're not even supposed to fly. Pick your animal. But I know this, they do fly, or whichever one's not supposed to flies, and these laws work. That law will lead you to freedom. That's the benefit of that law. So let's take a look. Law number four. The law of willing, and you can get this law of willing, is right here in the 12 laws of life recovery. Here comes law number four. Welcome to looking at these next laws, four, five, and six. And the first one that we start with is the law of willingness. Now, when we're willing, we can grow. When we're unwilling to do anything but just do what we think we ought to do, we're not going to grow. Now, the thing I like about this being number four, is that if I've done uh, the law of humility, then I can be humbly willing to grow, to do things in a different way. Colossians 3.23 says, Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. And I've always tried to do that. I've always failed at it. But, but it really is such a great verse to keep in mind. Now, Psalm 51, 12 says, Restore to me the joy of my salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. So it's important that we have this willingness. It's, it's all through Scripture. Now, what do we have? Stubborn resistance. That's what comes out of us. We want to do things, and we want to, well, like a little child, uh, we only want God to help us do it on our own because that's what a child wants. Help me do this by myself, Dad. Rather than, Dad, just show me, help me, whatever. Now, recovery means that I'm going to submit to God's way of doing it, not my dad's and not mine, if it's different. So we don't want to miss this one. You can either continue to try to do it on your own, or you can initiate healing, growth, love, just by being willing to do whatever it takes to change and recover. And I might add first, to see and understand my situation, the reality that I put myself in. Growth can't happen until somebody is caught up in the grip of sin and is willing to do the work and let go of the power that sin has over his or her life. You know, there was a married couple, and he was addicted to porn, and she was devastated. 
he confessed to her and oh my goodness, it was horrific. And she wanted him to get help. Well, no recovery program means no recovery. He was not willing, he was not humbly willing, and he couldn't make the changes. In fact, he was defending himself. Now, I believe that the sign of alcoholism is a tolerance that increases because you got to drink a lot of alcohol to get addicted to alcohol. So that myth about one little drink, you could be an alcoholic, not really true. So I noticed that my tolerance for alcohol was going up. So fortunately, I knew that. And fortunately, I had enough failure that I was willing to do things God's way. And one day I just said this, I think I've had my share. <laughs> I think I've had my share. Now, it shouldn't be that simple. But after I said that, I never took a drink again. Well, maybe you've had your share of gambling or maybe you've had your share of whatever it is that's trapped you and gotten you stuck and destroyed relationships between uh, you and other people. When we get honest and we realize that we've got that stubbornness, that it's a weakness, then we can say, okay, I think I might be willing to look at it from a different perspective. Ephesians 3.17 reminds us to root ourselves into God's love, not our own ways. Think about this. If I'm rooted in my love for alcohol, I'm not rooted in God's love. It's alcohol I'm rooted in. So when we abandon that plan and put some deep roots into healthy soil, we become a healthy being that is connected to God, willing to follow God, and then, of course, a growing human being. The only key is that this, this soil needs to be healthy and we need to be willing to grow. Pure, godly wisdom makes peace in relationships. That's what we need. Peace in our relationships versus sin and self-sufficiency that makes for anger, resentment, and bitterness. That's not good. We don't want that. What we want is the peace that passes all understanding. That's only going to come when we're willing to do the tough things. Welcome back. Well, hopefully you can see that in the laws of life recovery, we get to experience a whole new way of living. And you also are most likely aware that our old way was not creating the life that God had planned for us. We needed a new way we, if we ever wanted to be free and it ends up following laws that set us free. Let's continue and let's look at law number five. And this is the law of sacrifice. Well, we've gone through four laws. Now we come to the fifth. It's the law of sacrifice. And what is going to be the result of that? Well, when we sacrifice, we're leading ourselves toward fulfillment. Or you could even say sacrifice leads to satisfaction, fulfillment. But first, you have to be willing to sacrifice. Um, here's a scripture right out of Hebrews. Don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. That's Hebrews 13, 16. Now, society's been telling us all along that fulfillment is going to happen if we get stuff, acquire things. And we are, by nature, takers. Well, recovery tells us that fulfillment is going to come with sacrifice. You know, there are some of the most responsible people that are being irresponsible in the area of sacrifice. Now, this is going to hurt some feelings, maybe. But some people, their God is not stuff out there in the world. You know what it is? It's stacks. They love their stacks of assets and money, and they're trying to accumulate as much as they can. Now, I'm not talking about irresponsibility. But at some point, you, you're just worshiping how big you can get your stack to be. God would like to use <laughs> that money and that sacrifice to build a connection with you that is so strong that it can't be broken. But 
we love comfort. We love stuff. And we love to have things our way. We're consumers. Now, addiction is a consumer problem. We want to please ourselves with more of whatever we're addicted to or dependent on. Drink, drugs, porn, food, gambling, people, sex, you name it. But Romans 12, 1, just one of the best scriptures ever in scripture, it tells us, and so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. The kind that, will, that God's going to find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you. And by the way, God has to do the transforming. It says, but let God transform you by changing the way that you think. Then you're going to learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Now, don't you want to know God's will? I do. I want to know what he wants for me, especially because it says it's perfect. But we'll never get there if we don't sacrifice. And if that sacrifice isn't for everything. I mean, we got to sacrifice our body, which means maybe we don't have that hot fudge sundae that just adds more poundage, takes more money away from wherever it could go to the hot fudge sundae maker. Or you sacrifice feelings. Sometimes you, you have to say, I have to let this resentment go. That's a great feeling to let go of. Sometimes you have to sacrifice your preferences so that you can stay connected with someone. So you're not just saying, well, I like chocolate. So go in there and buy chocolate ice cream because I want chocolate, big baby. So we have to sometimes sacrifice preferences. And sometimes we have to sacrifice our desires. I'd like to go on this big golf trip for two weeks to Europe. Honey, we had a baby yesterday. So I think this would be a really bad time for you to go. Now, what if you lived with gratitude for all Christ has already done for you? And what if your life was just so thankful for everything that's all about you? Wouldn't that be fulfilling? But we get stuck in the junk of this world. I think it's really important to stick our heads up above the junk and accept Christ's sacrifice, to think about it, see it, and set ourselves apart from the things of the world. Shift our thinking to let go of old thoughts and habits and adopt God's thoughts and His way of thinking. And accept God's plan. It's not your plan, but it's a perfect plan because it comes right from God. Living in God's will means sacrificing but it also means experiencing the goodness of his purpose for your life. Now, let's take a moment and stop and reflect on what you need to sacrifice. Where is it in your life that you've got too much stuff? So look at that. Now, if you're going to seek to live a fulfilled life, you have to sacrifice some of uh, your ways and Sacrifice it for God's way, God's plan. Because God's got you, He made you, He saw you, created you for a purpose. And you know, everybody's out there uh, looking for their passion or trying to live out their passion. That is perhaps not the best. Maybe we need to live out our purpose, what we were uh, created for. So look at uh, what you need to let go of, what you need to sacrifice. And, you know, I'm in the same boat. Uh, I love goodwill. I love having collections. And I reached a point where I said, I think we've got enough stuff here. <laughs> in fact, I think we've got too much. And so I'm sacrificing and putting it right back in goodwill. My family has suggested that I put a sticker on the things that I give back to goodwill. The sticker would simply say, Steve, you've already owned this. Don't buy it again. I don't know what it is for you, but you're going to know what it is for you that you need to sacrifice 
so that your life is attuned with God and attuned with the others around you and not full of the junk that you need to get rid of. And when we come back, we'll go into law number six, which is the law of faith that always results in hope. Are you going through your struggles alone? Do you want someone to talk to to help you through your pain? Do you feel like a failure when you relapse again, telling yourself, next time will be different? Don't walk this path alone anymore. Join a life recovery group today and be a person that your friends and family can be proud of. God created us to be in community and we believe everyone can benefit from a life recovery experience. There are life recovery groups all over the country and if there isn't one in your area, we can help you start one. Life recovery brings recovery to you right where you are. You'll take a journey with others to find healing and freedom. Whether you're looking to join a group or start one, New Life Ministries is here for you. Call us at 1-800-NEW-LIFE or visit liferecoverytoday.net. Welcome back again. Well, as you look at this next law, hopefully you can see how all of these laws have this tremendous impact on anyone's recovery. The sixth law is the law of faith. It may not sound like it goes together, but it really is an important law. And I think it's going to be clearer after you look at this segment. But the sixth law, the law of faith, I hope and pray this could open some windows for you. All right, welcome back, and now we're ready for the sixth law, the law of faith, which results in hope. And, uh, you know, there's always a requirement of faith for us to experience real hope. You know, a person without faith, you're just, uh, you're getting sucked into the world, and the world is not going to do much for you. So faith is the thing that leads us to the spiritual life leads us to the holy God who wants us to live with him forever. Now, we're prone to be reactive, and we're prone to act hopeless when something bad happens to us. Well, if that happens every time, if that's the way we're prone, then actually our faith is deteriorating. We need to have faith to have hope. Now, how do you develop faith? Well, it takes time. You set aside time to study Scripture. Well, okay, you don't want to study. Maybe it's too hard. You set aside time at least to read the Bible. My wife and I created the One Year Bible for Men, the One Year Bible for Women. That's one that helps you look at a plan where you read the Bible through, and then you can pick certain parts. We have commentary on them that you could study. Another way to build faith is meditation on God, His character, His nature becomes part of you the more you can meditate on it and the more peace you experience. And then, of course, prayer, time with God, asking, uh, thanking God, and just being with God. Stronger faith always results in an ability to cope with the downsides of life so that we can, rather than get stuck, die, whatever, we can grow. And we can build our strength and we can experience hope. Now, let's look at faith. Faith is first, well, there are some barriers to this faith that has to be first. And when we recognize those barriers, um, maybe we've had some poor teaching. Maybe life's been so hard. We just can't imagine that God is so good. We have this devastating loss, and we start to see others and experience others by what they own, what they manage, what they've done, how wealthy they look. It's all about material success if we don't have faith. Because again, you can have everything here on earth, but without faith, you're not going to be in the next place. And faith means I'm going to trust that this scripture is true. And I'm going to believe what those people wrote. That's what my faith is going to do. And if I 
have that faith and that faith says this Bible is true, I am going to experience hope. Now, sometimes we do things that aren't very helpful. We make vows and we develop conclusions that are very hard to break or reconsider. So rather than, okay, let's just say I'm a woman. And again, I'll use this example. I've been hurt by my dad. Okay, so now I could make a vow. I will never let any man get close enough to me to control me or hurt me. Or I develop a, an unhealthy conclusion. All men are. All men are angry or all men are abusive. That's not true. But see, I put those out there to protect myself and I don't have good relationships with men as this woman who was hurt by a father. But with faith, I don't have to make the vow and I don't have to come to some conclusion about every man out there. Faith leads me to be free of a vow that I make, which really is a way of manipulating my world so that I can feel safe. I want to feel safe because my faith is healthy. Now, how do you do this? Well, you start to search for God. How do you do that? Maybe you talk to somebody. Maybe you read the Bible or you read a Bible book, one that's about the Bible, or you read a biblically based book. And that way you can understand some things that are hard to understand. Although I want to say this. Yeah, there are places in scripture that are difficult to understand. But if you just looked at the part that's really easy to understand, you can live by that part of Scripture. So, you, and here's the other thing. You don't need a lot of faith. You know, the Bible says just a mustard seed. That's the size of the faith we need. Why is that? Because, you know, it talks about the mustard seed being the littlest, tiny little seed but it grows into this huge, huge plant. You can't ignore it. Um, so if you've got this little bit of pure faith, you can do great things and have great hope in the things that you do. Faith gives us access to walk daily with Jesus. And that allows us to shift our thinking over from our struggles, our horrible things, and uh, our uh, thinking we're going to fail and mess up every time, to moving that thought to focus on and be confident in Christ. Now, endurance comes next. We need to be able to endure because our faith is so strong, our hope is so rooted in truth that we can endure. And, you know, endurance is key to a strong character. And let me just uh, mention this. That when you're in recovery, you're recovering character. You're not just stopping something. So somebody comes to you and says, I need you to coach me on how to stop it. Well, that's, no, no. Uh, it's not just about stopping. It's about starting to do the things that are going to build character in your life. Now, experience, if we learn the lessons of experience, uh, then we have the ability to grow from the experience that maybe we never wanted or it was just so painful, but maybe God needed to provide that experience so that our character would grow. And when we have character, see, we're able to make the right choices when the wrong ones are the most appealing. And that's not easy to do. We need to have enough faith that we're working with other people of faith and we're forming a path that works for us, works with God, and works with the people around us. We need to be faithful. And it needs to be steadfast so that when we question our faith, we're quite confident we have been faithful and we do have faith. And when we do that, all of a sudden, hope starts to develop in our heart. You know, I've got hope because I know that God loves me. I've got hope because the Holy Spirit fills me and it fills me with his love. And when I feel that love, then I feel God's peace and I have great hope for the future. 
Now, I would encourage you to take a look at faith in Scripture and your faith. You see all throughout Scripture people that are cowardly. Like the New Testament tells us that people were following Jesus, but some of the stuff that happened, they just went home. They didn't want to do it anymore. But why don't you look at what is faith all about in your life? Sometimes we have faith because we want a blessing from God. Other times we have faith because we want a connection from God. And when we really truly get rid of all the distraction, the things that get us stuck or addicted or hooked, then our faith can grow. And I really believe that it happens with every person. The stronger the faith, the stronger the hope. Simply focus on what are the things that are limiting my faith. And maybe look at what are the things that if I had had more faith, I wouldn't have gotten in trouble. I wouldn't have chosen these things that became a dependency or an addiction, uh, something, a struggle that I just never get rid of. Look at those things in your own life because once you do that for you, you're better able to do it for the people that came to you and wanted you to experience with them uh, some kind of a path out of the struggle they're right in the middle of. Well, I was just thinking, coming to the end here, um, I want to read you Hebrews 6.19 from the New Living Translation. It says this, This hope is a strong and trustworthy anger for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Now, that's making an analogy, essentially, or a reference to the curtain where, you know, the Holy of Holies, nobody could go in there but the priest. And there was this curtain that protected all of that. And uh, this hope that we have, based on the faith that we experience, takes us right through that curtain to the inner sanctuary. That's what I want for you. Well, faith, it leads to hope. Without faith, without action, not a lot of hope. Hey, thanks for watching today. I hope and pray that you'll grab a copy of these 12 laws. They really can turn your life around. And if there's something that we can help you with, well, just call us 1-800-NEW-LIFE. But more than anything, I love getting to do this with you, and I hope you're going to be here next time for our next Life Recovery Today, and maybe invite a friend. See you then. Thanks for joining us for Life Recovery Today with Stephen Arterburn. We hope this program has helped you integrate God's truth and wisdom into your recovery journey. This program is brought to you by New Life Ministries, and it's your support that keeps this program on the air. When you contact us for any reason, be sure to let us know that you watch on NRB. Call us at 1-800-NEW-LIFE or go to liferecoverytoday.net. Please join us again next week for more Life Recovery Today.